Welcome to the Small Group Leader Podcast, a podcast by small group leaders for small group leaders to be equipped and encouraged as they make disciples for Jesus. My name is Derek Lynn, and this is the first episode of what we will be calling Uncut Interviews. While doing this podcast, I get the amazing honor to interview some incredible people from all across the country and even around the world. My job is then to take these inspiring interviews and extract some of the best content from them surrounding a specific topic to fit our 30-minute time frame. Oftentimes, what you hear in a normal episode of this podcast is just a small glimpse of the full interview that took place, leaving out content that is too good not to be shared. So in these uncut interviews, you will get a fuller picture of the person I'm interviewing and the wisdom they are sharing. These special episodes will be released in addition to our normal content for your benefit. We hope you enjoy these episodes and getting to hear a little bit more from some of our guests. In this episode, you will get to hear my uncut interview with Derek Britt. Derek was featured in our episode on missional rhythm that we released last week. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, definitely go check it out. Today, I'm excited to share with you the entirety of my interview with Derek, where he expounds on some of his thoughts, answers a few more questions, and gives us insight to help us become better small group leaders. Awesome. We're here now with Derek Britt, campus pastor at Indiana University Chi Alpha and the teacher of Missional Rhythm. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. It's good to be here. So good to have you. So to kind of start this off, how did this teaching come about? Where did it come from? And in what ways have you seen your ministry and your small group leaders grow since you started teaching and implementing this idea of missional rhythm? Yeah, I think for me, thinking about our students and how we can serve them. I mean, I, as a director, I'm thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking about you know trying to get into their world. And in terms of where it started, I think, honestly, personally, for me, it started... And just, I recognized I have a burden for the campus. I'm a, I've gone and I've raised money, you know, from my friends and family, from churches. I'm coming to this campus because I believe that the university is the most strategic mission field on planet earth. And I want to spend my life here, but I'm also recognizing, you know, I'm 37, I'm bald, you know, (laughs) I'm, you know, walking on campus, going into a dorm and saying, you know, let's play video games, you know, like that, that's probably not going to be a thing. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I started processing this personally as I, you know, reading the scripture, I was reading the story of Esther and it just really messed me up. Uh, I mean, it, it came alive in a way that mm-hmm. was, that was real. And so, you know, that story, you know, if you, you're listening and you don't know the story and go, go read it. It's, it's powerful, but yeah. essentially in a nutshell, you know, there's, there's a character, Mordecai, who he has a burden that, that he has taken on because he's heard some bad news. He's heard, you know, the Jewish people are going to get destroyed by this guy. Haman mm-hmm. this is all really bad. Um, something needs to be done. And he happens to have, you know, a relative who is the queen. Yeah. And so he recognizes something in the process. He's, I want to save the Jewish people but I can't go in front of the king because it's not my, I mean, I I would die, you know, certainly I would die if I went in front of the king. And so if I want anything to be done about this, I have to find a way to transfer the burden that I have from me to Esther, who shares a room with the king so that she can bring this, the, the need for a solution to the king and to save the Jewish people. And the whole story in the beginning is about Mordecai convincing Esther that this is necessary and I need, we need, the Jewish people need you and, and you need to utilize your influence in the way that you have it, a way that I don't, you do. And, you know, as I began to process, that was several years ago, I preached a message about it and had processed it personally, but I recognize a lot of what campus ministry is, is me seeing the need on campus, the desperate need on campus, seeing the opportunity on campus, but knowing if I can't find a way to transfer the burden of what's the the burden and the opportunity on campus from me to a student. Yeah. We're never going to be in the right places at the right times to be able to share the gospel, to be able to impact people's lives, you know, with these people who actually like the only way we can do that is by by getting the people of influence, which in, in my opinion yeah. are students. They're student small group leaders. They're people who are going to classes with people every day. Yeah. Um you think about, you know, students are sharing rooms 
they're roommates with people. They're they're living down the hall from people that are gonna run the world one yeah. day. And yeah. right now, you know, they're you know hoping for a home cooked meal. Maybe you know they're <laughs> you know they're they're just students. They're, yeah. they're they're not there. But so basically, the things that I can't do, even though I have a burden, how do I f- help students who are on a rhythm with students? One, how do I help them? understand they're uniquely positioned at for a very short window of their lives yeah. to influence the entire world just by the normal college student rhythm that they're on. And then taking that a layer deeper, thinking about one, where has God placed you mm-hmm. and how do you uniquely serve Jesus in this sphere? And how do you, you know, live on rhythm with the people, you know, if you're an athlete, you know, if you're mm-hmm. this, if you're that, you know, how do you live on rhythm with those people? And then in, in other cases, challenging students who are on one rhythm to say, what if you started thinking about moving to another rhythm to, and being a true missionary and yeah. reorienting your life about getting on a rhythm with athletes, about getting on a rhythm with this people group or that demographic or this ethnicity or these international students and trying to think about how do we how do we think differently about where people are at? And yeah. instead of asking them to come over to us, what if we moved into those places, you yeah, know, like Esther going sure. into the room with the king because she knows this is a place of influence. Like what if we moved into those places as students and we took seriously the opportunity that we have while we're on campus as a student? Yeah, that's so good. Um, so what does this look like walked out at Indiana University Chi Alpha for y'all? Yeah, I think I think if you, if you, as you process, you know, what I taught at RUI and what we're, what we're, processing like what I've taught in Chi Alpha about missional rhythm a lot of what I'm teaching is us going from you know maybe just kind of a church service mentality and mm-hmm. moving through the spectrum all the way into living on rhythm as missionaries discipling people living incarnationally which mm-hmm. you know unpacking that idea um, living incarnationally is is basically what Jesus did he, he recognized a the problem in the world yeah. and his solution was um, you know, you think about a, a problem in the inner city and it's like, oh, we really need to impact that and we really need to do something about that. And so we, we kind of run programs and, you know, we do this or we yeah. do that or we send, you know, whatever. We we have our solutions. But Jesus' solution was to move into the neighborhood yeah. and to be in, in the center of what was happening in the culture and in, with the people. And so incarnation, you know, is Jesus, God becoming man we're emulating Jesus maybe in some ways, but obviously we're not. So it's a concept of yeah. incarnational living is really just following the example of Jesus so that he yeah. felt, you know, transformation happens by, you know, planting the seed among the people. And so we are, we are living in the same way. And so yeah. the way that that plays out locally for us is, is moving from just, you know, people come to us like the church service mentality mm. to how do we find a way to that we're not we are gathering still but we're gathering to scatter so so yeah. we're actually not going from the outside in and the the high calling of a you know of a Chi Alpha leader is to invite somebody to come hear me preach on a on a Tuesday night mm-hmm. but the calling of a Chi Alpha student is to gather and to be equipped and to go out to scatter and to continue to live on these rhythms with people. And so we've seen that over time as we made a transition from kind of the church service into this missional incarnational rhythm ideas that we are on mission living among people and we are we are serving people the way Jesus did and, and inviting them into the kingdom in everyday life. And so yeah. that the way it plays out practically, um, to answer your question, which I think is your question, yeah. um, the way it plays out practically for us which you can imagine as contextualized as a college campus is. So what I mean by that is, you know, college students are more closely related in their daily rhythms than Mm -hmm. they are to anyone in the world. You know what I'm saying? Every college student has a similarity in, in how they're doing it. But, but when you actually move on to the campus, you recognize there's some really significantly different rhythms and there's separation between people groups and there's, places where if we approach it one way, we might reach a lot of people, but we're, yeah. if we approach it this way, we're never going to reach Greeks. We're never mm-hmm. going to reach, you know, this community or that community. And so the way it plays out practically for us is, is one recognizing that, you yeah. know, that every student we're on rhythm with, so we can live missionally incarnationally on the campus. And we are on rhythm every single day in classes with athletes, with Greek life, with, 
you know, we have some rhythm in common with all of them. Yeah. So part of it is just recognizing I'm an ambassador for Christ on my campus, living on rhythm with all of these people and looking for all opportunities that I have as a small group leader to do that. Every freshman that comes to our campus, eventually, you know, every Greek student was a freshman moving yeah. into the dorm. So, you know, every athlete was in the same category. So there is always going to be an initial possibility, but it's it's the framework. It's a It's a mindset that we're trying to get every student to think, what is my role as I look across this campus? Am I, am I living incarnationally like Jesus, looking at these people saying, you know, and having compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd? And am I processing what's my role in doing this? Yeah. But then individually, like we have groups of people that we pull together and we say, hey, what do you guys think about within this larger rhythm, all college students on a similar rhythm? we noticed this group of people is on a little bit of a different rhythm. What if yeah. you all decided, you know, I'm going to invest all of my energy sacrificially in this place and living on this rhythm. And what would it look like uh, to do it in this area of the campus or with this yeah. demographic of people? And so it's not, that's not like digging super deep in terms of practical, yeah. but that's, it's a recognition. Like we're all reaching freshmen. We're all reaching incoming students. We all believe like every student has the capacity to change the world yeah. and we're going to reach all of them and we're all in a rhythm with all of them, but also recognizing as we gather resources and we have more people, we have more opportunity to go to places that we're not doing as well. You yeah. know, we don't have a lot of fraternity members. We don't have a lot of sorority members. We don't have a lot of, you know, Latino students or African American students or white students or, or whatever. Yeah. And recognizing, you know, everybody needs the gospel. So how are we finding a way to, think about where we're not doing well and where the gospel is not being deposited and how do we think differently about going to those places. And my hope would be as people listen to this, that they're thinking, you know, man, we got a whole lot more of the campus to reach. And so our, our students hopefully are thinking that at, at Indiana university, but you know, people are processing, you know, when you look around me, you know, there's a lot of white people here, you know, I know that's mm -hmm. kind of whatever, but there's a lot of, you know, we're all black or we're all, this or we're all that mm -hmm. like are we thinking man god god came to or jesus came incarnationally to save everybody yeah and just because somebody joined a fraternity doesn't mean that they they don't get to hear the gospel yeah and so so what work needs to be done my hope would be some student is inspired to say on my campus and on other campuses you know would yeah. be inspired to say i'm going to be the one to go do that you know for sure and you, you gather some people and say let's go live on that rhythm together mm-hmm so good. So some of our listeners might already have a small group that's made up of people who are from all different departments on campus with many different rhythms. What would be your advice for these small group leaders and how they can contextualize to a couple different rhythms at the same time? So I, I think I would say when it comes to students who have different people from different places and, you know, how do I make sense of multiple rhythms that are already in my small group. You know, like I have a guy that's in a fraternity or I have a guy that's an athlete and you know, we're and we're trying to make it work and it's tough sometimes. And it's like, you know, I, I don't think you blow that up and say, you know, well, I'm only going to reach fraternities and <laughs> this guy's just going to have to go, you know, cause I'm yeah. going to do this. I think it's being faithful with what God's given you. And sometimes, For sure. you know, scattering seed in a sense, you're, you're, seeing a harvest from from multiple places and so on our campus just because we're focused and we're pointing at different people groups and we're thinking about how can we be intentional about taking new ground not just what we've done in the past but how do we reach all 40 plus thousand students just because we're pointing in those directions doesn't mean that we don't have small groups with people who are on marginally different rhythms mm. in fact i would take say it's really valuable that we have that because if you're reaching freshmen like i said if if you are reaching freshmen, then you are theoretically reaching a lot of different people groups. And so you never know whenever you're investing in that athlete or you're investing in that fraternity guy and it is hard work and it is difficult. You don't know that you're, you may get to the end of the year and that fraternity guy, his life is completely transformed by Jesus because of your faithfulness. And even though it wasn't, it didn't feel like a perfect rhythm and you were struggling to make things work. Now, in his sophomore year, maybe he is moving into the fraternity house and he's radically saved. And he's saying to you, can you help me reach this community with yeah. the gospel? And so I'm saying it's some of, sometimes it is pointing very directly at a community and sometimes it's scattering seed and letting things flow out of that. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's simple at the same time, we're still just making disciples. We're yeah. still being faithful with what God's given us. Well, we're all we're trying to do is is maybe do a little better 
at times at pointing more specifically at people groups that are underrepresented in our Chi Alpha group or are underrepresented in the kingdom on our mm-hmm. campus. Um, how many fraternity and sorority people are Christians who are living out their faith and are part of a faith community? And if the answer to that question is not very many, then maybe we should have some type of burden for those people yeah. and maybe God's using that guy that's coming to your group every week but you're having a hard time getting him to anything else maybe he's going to use that you know to do this and so I would just encourage people to be faithful with their small group and to recognize like maybe the future maybe it's not a rhythm now maybe it doesn't make sense now but maybe it will you yeah. know next year and so it is still just about making disciples sometimes you know yeah it is yeah, still just about sure. being faithful sometimes dude that's good so what are some characteristics or things you've seen in small group leaders in your Chi Alpha that have done this or do this and understand this really well? I would say a student, if, if I'm saying just an outstanding like student, like, when I say outstanding, I mean they stand out yeah. to me. It would be someone who is thinking deeply. An example of that might be somebody who's thinking deeply about maybe, I know that upperclassmen don't live on campus, but maybe I should. Yeah. Because, man, what an opportunity to Mm -hmm. live among people and to share the gospel with people. That, to me, is somebody who's processed, one, the burden, Mm -hmm. and two, the incarnational, missional approach. Like, I have such a heart for these people. Or I'm going to move into, if I am going to live on campus or off campus, I'm going to go to a place where there's a high concentration of international students because I know that the best way to reach those people is not just trying to catch them on the way by, but living among them yeah. and and being connected with them. So I think like what I notice in students who do get this, who do understand it, is they do have a burden to reach the campus and they're willing to do things that most students are not willing to do. They're processing questions that a lot of students aren't processing. They're not just thinking, how do I lead my small group? You know, what discussion questions am I asking this week? You know, things like mm-hmm. that. They're they're thinking about every day I'm walking by people who need the gospel. Um, whenever I'm I'm having and this isn't just extroverts, by the way. Um, you know, <laughs> like it's introverts and extroverts. Thank you, Jesus. Like, you know, like but but am I being purposeful? Are my rhythms about me, you know, or am I finding natural rhythms that put me in contact with people who need the gospel? Mm-hmm. And you know, I mean, just simple things like when I do my one-on-ones or two-on-ones, if I'm meeting with my my small group, you know, where am I doing those? Am I am I doing them in the dorm room? Am I doing them in in the you know off campus somewhere, or am I doing them in in the dorm in the uh, in the food court? You know, mm-hmm. where all these other students are, where we might be able to you know, reconnect with that person that we met at a hangout last week or, you know, whatever, but you're, you're thinking and processing and being intentional about what your normal rhythms are like. I think when I see students doing that, I recognize that they, that they get it. Um, and I, and I think that's, it's powerful and it's contagious. You know, you want to be like that, you know, Mm -hmm. you, you look up to people like that. Uh, But I think it does start with that burden piece though. It's a, it's a big, piece of the puzzle. You know, if you're just externally conforming to be a small group leader because my friends are small group leaders and all that, I mean, those things are easily discernible sometimes. You know, you recognize the one that's like weeping over his dorm, that's weeping Mm -hmm. over this people group. And and God uses that. And and you have some instincts that kick in as a student because you know the campus in ways that I don't. You know, you have instincts that start to kick in and you start to bear fruit. Yeah. So in your teaching on missional rhythm we maybe have heard of attractional in the context of large group meetings but in it you talk about attractional small groups Um, and I before hearing you talk about that have never really heard that or thought about an attractional small group so what does it necessarily mean to have an attractional small group in the way you talked about it yeah I think I think it's a it's a way of articulating, you know, I, I heard this a long time ago. Mark Rutland is a incredible preacher and communicator, but he was somebody that had a big influence on my life and he used to preach a message called power, not power. Mm-hmm. And it was just awesome. Um, <laughs> but he would preach this message um, from Acts chapter one and it's, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, be my witnesses. But just before that, he says, 
know, the disciples come to Jesus and say, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he's like, it's not for you to know the times or dates. The Father set by his own authority, but you'll receive power. And so the message was the disciples were thinking kingdom, but Jesus was saying kingdom. And the disciples were thinking power and and what what I was going to gain from this, but Jesus was saying power. And it was just, it's drawing out how the disciples were trying to understand what Jesus was doing Mm -hmm. when he was talking about the kingdom, when he was talking about receiving power. And they were hearing it one way, you know, that we're going to rule the world maybe, you know, at certain points, you know, (laughs) James and John or whatever. But then at other points, Jesus is saying, no, that's not what I mean. I actually mean this. So it, it, the, the message highlights even to me how that works in the church world, you know, and sometimes I think people are saying, Oh, I know how to do small groups, but it's like, well, I don't know if you know how to do small groups the way I want you to do small groups. Yeah. Or you're saying small group, but I mean small group, Mm -hmm. you know, and just a recognition that these are different. And I think one of the dangers is we think small group is like a silver bullet. You know, this is the way ministry is supposed to be done. Jesus did this. And so that's why we do small groups. But really what you could be doing is you have an attractional large group meeting, you know, that's just invite everybody to come and, you know, I'll yeah. preach and we'll have great music and we'll have a good show and then we'll all go home and we'll come back and do it the next week. Um, what the danger is in, in small group is that you're not actually becoming non-attractional. You're not becoming missional just because you have a small group. You might just be changing the point of attraction. So rather than attraction to the large group, now you're just saying, oh, small groups are the best thing ever. You're going to love it. You know, we always have great snacks, <laughs> you know, or we always <laughs> have this or we always have that. Yeah. And it's just a, a recognition that, you know, small group, it's just the big picture in a smaller setting. And we're just trying to do a really good job with the curriculum, you know, with, you know, meeting a yeah. need in this way. And so we're just still saying, come to small group. The leader is the center of it. And they're, they're calling people in and trying to attract people to attend every week Yeah. versus a group of people who live their lives together. Yeah. Who iron sharpens iron. And it's, you know, daily they were meeting in the temple courts. That's mm-hmm. what Acts says. You know, they were meeting every single day. This is a, a life thing, which in college, we have the greatest, and I, I mentioned this in the talk, but we have, this is the greatest opportunity anyone has ever had to do the Acts 2 thing. Yeah. Because we can actually meet together every single day. You know, we can, we're, we're, we live on, like, on top of each other, you know, on different levels of an apartment complex. or whatever. I mean, We're all concentrated in an area that allows us to meet together every day. And so small group, when it comes to discipleship, I think it's an everyday thing. It's actually yeah. living life together and not inviting people to the small group meeting, but inviting someone into our lives to yeah. live with us every day, to to play basketball with us, you know, to or to go where they're at and play mm-hmm. basketball with them, you know, or whatever it is. But I'm saying it's it's more than that. And so I build on that obviously, like going from just a attractional small group to a discipleship small group, which is which is focused on the everyday. It's focused on the intention of the leader is to disciple these men or disciple these women. Yeah. But then I move it to missional as well. And how do we go from just a discipleship small group to one that is actually built on re- not just like reaching Christians and discipling them a little bit better, but to again, reach the whole campus and to be mm-hmm. open to the whole campus and to point at something, you know, point at a place that, that needs Jesus desperately on our campus. And so I, I, I hope that answers it, but I think, it's just real easy. It's like a hundred people on a Tuesday night that can be attractional. Yeah. Well, just because we do it on a Thursday night and we have a small group leader doesn't mean we've changed philosophies. You know, it just means that now we're just inviting people to this thing. And then it's like, well, we'll see you next week. Yeah. So if I'm a small group leader on a campus and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, man, I really do just invite the guys to come to a meeting once a week. Don't really do much in between. There's not a lot of life on life. What do you think some of the first steps are for that small group leader transitioning from what they might be starting to realize is an attractional style small group to the more discipleship missional style small group leading? What would you say some of the first realizations, some of the first steps they could start taking to make that shift in the way they disciple? Yeah, I think I think the first steps are are rhythm issues, right? They're they're rhythm things. So we all eat together, mm-hmm. like, and and if if I'm thinking about my small group and we're actually living life together, which you know other language would just be like we're actually friends. Yeah, you know I'm not just their <laughs> small group leader. That I'm, you know I'm saying if you find yourself texting people every week about small group 
and then texting at people every week about coming to service, but everything in between is kind of quiet, mm -hmm. then you're not, you're not living life together and you're, you're a, an, a small group leader, an attractional small group leader, but you're not friends. You yeah. know, you're not, you're not impacting them. You are, they look at you in that way because yeah. they, they recognize like, this isn't what friends do. Everybody knows what that, that looks like. And so if you're not showing them and modeling to them, like, no, I care about you outside of these things. So, you know, how do you do that? You know, if you're eating together um, or if you're eating, like, what if you ate together, yeah. <laughs> you know, or <laughs> if you're playing basketball, it's like, well, what if we did that together? Yeah. And, or if, if they're doing so, or if they're working out, you know, I got guys that just have made decisions, you know, like you work out, I work out, you know, let's, let's do that together. You know, mm -hmm. just finding the little things and, and, we, we talk about it on a spectrum, you know, there's organized and there's organic. And when it comes to discipleship, you're going to have organized components that, you know, we have services that's planned every week, same time. We've got yeah. small groups planned every week at the same time. But if you have all organized and no organic, it's recognizable. So what you're asking is, how do I get to the more organic mm -hmm. things? And I think it's just common sense. It's recognizing that like, I've got to reorient around these guys. I can't have my friends over here and my small group over here. Yeah, like, for sure. Oh, these are my friends, and I've got to treat them in that way, or they'll, they won't. They won't really understand mm -hmm. what life with Jesus actually looks like. They certainly won't understand how to disciple someone because I haven't spent any time with them outside of maybe lessons I'm teaching or discussions yeah. I'm leading. And so that could be, you know, like I, the things that I mentioned. But I think trying to find daily rhythms of asking questions, it's text messages, you know, it's, have you read your Bible today? You know, what are you reading in your Bible today? Um, things like that, where you're engaging consistently. Um, but it, again, it, it may be as simple if you're listening to this, you know, it may be as simple as like being convicted by God yeah. that, you know, you are, you're doing the mechanics of leading a small group, but you don't actually care about your people. You're not yeah. fighting for them. You're not willing to reorient your life around them. Yeah. And so I, I don't know. I think, I think there's tons of ways to do that. You know, you're a college student, you know, you're not, but the people listening yeah. are. Yeah. 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 Um, and you can figure that out and, yeah. and studying together, you know, you don't, you, you study with other people. Like, can you get your guys to do that every week? You know, can you, can you go out after a Tuesday service? Can you start a rhythm? Maybe you can get a guy, one of your guys, you know, who's starts to hang out with you. Yeah. And then you can start getting that guy to invite other guys, you know, yeah. to go do stuff. And um, so it's not the small group leader saying it, but it's the member who's saying it. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about that a lot going from a hub to a web. So as a small group leader, you're the hub. Everybody comes here because of you. But what if they became close enough that they weren't coming because of you anymore? They were becoming, they were coming to small group and they were hanging out after they were hanging out during the week because they actually want to hang out with each other and their friends. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly talking to our leaders about going from a hub to a web. Yeah. Um, and, and you want to get to a place where everybody's doing stuff and they don't need you there. You know, yeah. that, that's, that's when you know you found some healthy discipleship going on in your group. Yeah, dude. And as someone who is here as a byproduct of people making that adjustment and sacrificing in their life, like it, like when people start doing that, and especially entire communities start doing it. There's such an incredible change that can happen. There's yeah. such an impact they can make on the people in their discipleship groups to where it, the sacrifices you're making isn't just so you can have a better small group. It's so that you can make better fathers and mothers and Absolutely. missionaries yes. and business workers. Yeah. And like, I'm grateful for people who did that for me. And it's what's um, crazy about it is, and I, I mean, small group leaders listening, you're, you're talking about people you're not talking about mighty men of God, you know, like that are on a pedestal yeah. in terms of everybody knows that they're great, you know, and everybody's heard their names and whatever. You're talking about your sophomore core group leader. Yeah. Your junior in college core group leader who was learning how to do it and just cared enough to try to figure it out. Yeah. And to try to hang out with you and to try to do those things and it changed your life. Yeah. So I think it's pretty inspiring to know these are not things that are unattainable. Yeah. That that the small sacrifices people are making, you're, you're sharing this at, at your old age, you know, looking back <laughs> and recognizing that made a huge impact on my life. It changed yeah. the trajectory of my life Yeah, because an Esther understood that I have a place of influence that other people don't have. And it, and it changed our lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Legitimately. Uh, 
I think people get caught up in thinking they have to be an Elon Musk or a yeah. Steve Jobs to make an impact in the world. But the biggest impact, especially with looking at transgenerational discipleship and the method of Jesus, yeah. is insert your name, insert your major, insert the amount of hours in the day you have, and you can be a person who changes the trajectory of the world. Absolutely. We're yeah. all here because Jesus came and found 12 people. Yes. Like, yeah. And that's just an incredible thought to me. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I want to say yeah. along that line, I think, and this is important, I hope it makes it in here to, to what we're saying, but yeah. one way that I talk about this is you're talking about how do you do, how do you get more than just the week to week? Yeah. We talk about how do you increase your hours with people? Cause like, I only got a certain amount of hours a week. Yeah. You know, I got class, I got this, I got that. So that we ask the question, how do you increase your hours? And that's the question of what am I already doing? Yeah. Like I'm eating, like I talked about earlier. And so Jesus spent extravagant time with his disciples and if we want to try to match what jesus is doing it's not going to be you know we got to cancel all our classes and, and do this so we've yeah. got to find ways like what are the things i'm doing already and how do i invite people onto that rhythm or how do i join people on that yeah and so i think it's a really important piece that's what i mean by studying and by playing basketball by working out these are things that you already do yeah how do you redeem that time you know that's not time that's lost and now i got to figure out time you know, to meet one-on-one -on -one with people, yeah. but how do I actually just bring people on to that with me? You yeah. Know? And so you're actually getting hours back. So you can spend 30 or 40 hours a week with the people in your small group yeah. because you're doing things that everybody does. You're just doing them together. So it's actually really practical if you can process it and, and figure out how to do it in your own life. Yeah. I think a lot of times we think of it as an add on, yeah, exactly. but in my mind, the way it functions, I, I think of it more, it has to be an add in. Like when yeah. you go up to the Coke machine and there's that little button for vanilla and you're like, should I? And yeah. then you do. And it makes that Coke taste 10 <laughs> times better. Right. And you didn't add a second drink. You just added something into what you already right. had. Exactly. And yeah. it made it so much sweeter. Yeah, um, that's good. <laughs> and that's, that's just how I kind of think of it a little bit, however odd that might sound. So <laughs> I, 29 year old Derek Lynn, understand this progression and development of missional rhythm that you've kind of talked about. What does 19 year old Mike or Sally, who's just starting out small group leading need to understand about missional rhythm? If they were to listen to this and remember nothing else, what do they need to know? I would say there is a, there is an element of what I'm trying to share, which is a big picture thing. It is, let's look at the whole ministry and mm -hmm. ask ourselves, you know, we're really good at reaching these people, but what about these people? Yeah. And so there is an element in the big picture of, you know, maybe we need to point people in different directions. You know, maybe what we've been doing in terms of let's go reach freshmen, let's go, you know, and after welcome week, we're building them up and we're sending them out and we're going back into welcome week and building them up and sending them out. That may be working great and we need to continue to do that. But what, what I'm trying to say is what about the places that we're not, breaking ground the places yeah. that we're, we don't seem to be impacting with the gospel so what i would say in terms of uh, the 19 20 21 year old you know sophomore junior senior small group leader maybe the grad student is starting to think about where we're not where there isn't a great witness of the gospel on mm -hmm. my campus how can i and people around me rally together and you know we've seen that we can bear fruit with freshmen if we do these things we haven't necessarily seen what kind of fruit we're going to bear maybe in Greek life or with grad students or whatever, but being willing to take that risk, being willing to devote those resources into those places and to think incarnationally about the, the, the issues that they're having and the, the things that they're facing. And if love finds a need and meets it, you know, something we talk about a lot, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. We know what it looks like for a freshman. What does that look like for the junior that's in the fraternity yeah. that has a lot of his social needs met? that a freshman who doesn't have any friends yet doesn't have. So the, it's basically putting mental energy toward, am I willing to go and die in these places with yeah. no promise of fruit, but to together go figure out these rhythms and to, to somehow find a way to live on rhythm with these people so they could experience the gospel. And I, I think of this, you know, as, as we're kind of wrapping it up, like the disciples were so one of the greatest, like apologetic things in my in my mind is that the disciples would have known did Jesus was Jesus raised from the dead. They would have known that mm -hmm. factually and to go and claim it is, is craziness. If it didn't happen, that's one, that's crazy yeah. Two, It's crazy to die for 
something that you know is a lie. You know, a lot of us have heard that, but it's yeah. just, they just wouldn't do it. So there's so much evidence for the resurrection just in terms of the disciples' lives. But think about it. Thomas, it's pretty great history on this. You know, Thomas gets on a boat after Jesus has ascended. You know, he's empowered the disciples. He gets on a boat and he sails to India. What does he know about India? You know, where's yeah. he? he's going out there. He's got no promise of fruit in this place, but he's he's getting on a boat and sailing around the world to go to this place and to share the gospel with people because Jesus so transformed his life. He's saying, I'm going to go live in this place with these people, just like Jesus did with me. And I think to do that, knowing I have no idea how this is going to turn out, I think it's just a challenge to students. Well, your first year as a small group leader, that's what it's like, right? You have no guarantee mm -hmm. of fruit. You don't know what it's <laughs> going to be. You're not on a boat going to India, you know, but it's like there's something going on. Yeah. But what about the places that we haven't reached yet? You know, are we getting on a boat, going to these places and investing our lives in people believing that we can bear fruit in these places too? And you think centuries and centuries and centuries later after Thomas did that, you know, there's a, in Southern India, there's a thriving church that, that's was because he got on a boat and did that, you know, mm -hmm. and most of us know someone from that place, from that culture, you know, we're connected in some way if we're on college campuses to people who are still feeling the impact of someone doing that. Mm -hmm. So what if that was true of Greek life on your campus? You know, what if that was true of, of African Americans on your campus, you know, who are facing very unique issues that, that white people are not facing. And what if we brought gospel witness into that and we, and we started, understanding and loving people well and meeting needs and communities and reconciling things and the gospel took root in an even more significant way than it already has in those communities and began to transform the campus and transform people i think it's just a, a matter of saying i don't know what's going to happen this is a little bit scary but somebody needs to go to these places and to do these things and have a pioneering spirit about about how we do that Thank you for listening to the Small Group Leader Podcast. Our goal is to equip and encourage you as you go out and make disciples who make disciples.